You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wine, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mom, Ernest Klein, Tim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. In the third grade, uh, my teacher, Mr. Strike, would take 20 minutes out of every uh, weekday and read something, usually nonfiction, or uh, usually fiction, rather, to the class, usually novels, and usually YA, which at that time was, I don't know what it was called, but it was, was not called YA. And he was reading to us from a story called Clone Catcher by a guy named Alfred Slope. And this is a sci-fi story about a PI whose job it is to track down clones of people uh, and return them to this penitentiary that they're supposed to live at until they become needed so that people, so that the clones can donate uh, organs and whatnot to their, uh, to their original hosts or donors. And, you know, the way he delivered that story verbally, the way he uh, provided for just absolutely captivating. And um, I've written a little bit of nonfiction, uh, which I don't want to get into. But in my nonfiction book, I dedicated the first one to him, uh, Mr. Strike, my third grade teacher, because he's the one that put me on the path of wanting to be a storyteller for sure. That's amazing. I, I love, you know, hearing these stories of of these people that, um, you know, kind of lit that fire under you. And, uh, you know, as you know, the, the path, you know, for a writer can be lonely uh, at times. There's a lot of time spent alone in in an office or at a kitchen table or whatever with a laptop or a notebook and and just just writing stuff all by yourself and it's it's always these people that that come back to you from time to time and these stories that you know when you question yourself and what the heck am i doing you know Mm -hmm. these people invariably come back up and uh, i I just love to hear that from people Mm -hmm. indeed so do, do you remember the first book that you read that just completely transported you to another place in time and and that awakening moment where you realized that books had this kind of power yeah absolutely uh that was then this is now by se hitton i think i was probably in the maybe the fifth grade fifth or sixth grade when i read it um certainly i had read other things before then but they were all childish so here comes this amazing coming of age story uh, and it's kind of like that, that paradigm between, uh, greasers and socialites. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I, I was attracted to it because I kind of identified as a greaser, uh, grew up in Detroit. Um, didn't have a whole lot of, I, I had no idea why I was drawn to writing, especially story writing, because I didn't have any examples of that in my life. My mom is an excellent writer, but she never encouraged me to, to make up stories to tell people and so forth. So when I read that was then, this is now, I was really blown away. And I think, I hope in some ways I was matured by the writing because that is really, I think, one of the quintessential coming of age novels, uh, especially, I guess, YA category. But um, that one and The Outsiders, of course. And then later on, eventually I got into science fiction hardcore, started reading William Gibson when I was in high school, and then that was it. I was trying to be sophisticated, and, uh, you know, <laughs> but I, I was I was blessed to be uh, reading such tremendously talented and forward thinking people uh, when I was a youth. Speaking of Essie Hinton, that was the quintessential um, coming of age stories that, that she wrote. And, and she was literally coming of age when she wrote those. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Which was, yeah. Which is kind of crazy because I, I've met so many people. Um, through the show that that were inspired, um, especially by her early writing that, um, uh, you know, if she can do this, uh, I can do this. And it really was a door opener. And it identified with lots of different uh, cross sections of culture and and cross sections of, I guess, class, if you will. Uh, Poor people, angry people, uh, well to do people. And that was something that I really, really enjoyed also about um, uh, Richard Wright. Native Son. Uh, what a prophetic book that was. 
kind of uh, just diving into a whole bunch of anti-McCarthyism before any of that became popular. I mean, he beat that by 10 or 15 years. And I, I kind of view Hinton the same way. They were just really ahead of their times. Right. Um, so, you know, what was, do you, do you remember the first um, time that, that a story idea kind of infected your brain and, and wouldn't let you go? Um, you, t- you talked about William Gibson. That He was a, a huge influence uh, on me in, in my earlier years. And talk about just opening up um, you know, my brain to possibilities when, when I start thinking about him, all kind of story ideas come to me and, uh, you know, some of them I've tried, some of them I haven't, but, um, do you remember what that first idea was that, that you said, I've got to write this? Well, I absolutely had to do a, uh, absolutely had to do a cyberpunk novel when I read William Gibson and, uh, that was kind of a misfire because that novel uh, it was about simulation theory and it was about concepts that really people didn't understand. In fact, going back and looking at, at Neuromancer now, which is Gibson's novel from the mid early to mid eighties. Um, it's really a tough read. And I, I don't know how I got through it so easily when I was a teenager, cause I go back and look on it now and I'm like, wow, this was a h- highly technical, uh, highly Uh, it's all kinds of big time abstractions and, and it, it was just, uh, really mind blowing to me at the time, but, uh, moving on from, uh, what was the question again, Hank? I'm sorry. Was like, what was, the, what was that first story idea that, that really yes, kind of absolutely look- wanted, wanted to clone Neuromancer. Um, <laughs> and it, that was kind of, a, uh, that didn't end well, uh, because it was extremely derivative and. I guess one thing that I've learned is everything's derivative derivative of its influences uh, because the humanities are, it's like a big soup of of personness, right? Our influences on each other, something you say in this conversation is going to affect something I say tomorrow to my son or to my daughter or to my girlfriend. And so, but but that's based on the humanity of it, you know? So it, it really was, something that I had to wake up to uh, as a young adult that you, you can't really just channel one writer. And if you do, you sound like a cover band, uh, right. <laughs> which to put it in the vernacular of music. So I started to try to adopt Steinbeck and Stephen King, especially the dark tower and Ayn Rand uh, on concepts of Liberty and Mark Twain because of that uh, country accessibility, that, that middle, middle of the road accessibility. Um, Richard Wright, S. E. Hinton, um, George Orwell. I mean, just because of the pure dissonance, like you got to wonder how happy was George when he wrote <laughs> Animal Farm. He wasn't a happy dude, right? No. And then, um, but then you get to some modern examples like Suzanne Collins. Okay, uh, wow, The Hunger Games. What an incredible cross section of like the cult of personality, the obsession with celebrity, and just a blatant uh, set of remarks on, on Marxism. And all of those things kind of uh, went into me finishing Failsafe. And eventually I was like, you know what? I've integrated enough. I've, I don't want to say appropriated enough, but I've recognized enough of that genius to be happy with what came out of my pen finally. What's funny, uh, TJ, and I, I love the way that you stated that, but if you, if you imitate one writer, um, then you're, you're a blatant imitator, uh, and, and you wear your influence on your sleeve. But if you, uh, if you're influenced by 10 writers and you Im- emulate them in certain ways, then, oh, he's, he's such a well-read, uh, author. And, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of funny how we, how we, um, we, we judge those. Um, um, yeah. Uh, so, so the first that William Gibson, uh, kind of knockoff, uh, didn't go anywhere. Uh, obviously, but did that do something uh, for you to, uh, you know, uh, for your confidence? Um, you know, a, a lot of people look at those early novels, we call them desk drawer novels or trunk novels or whatever, as failures, um, because in any other kind of creative endeavor, you would think of those as failures. But we as writers look at those as stepping stones and things that we do to 
work out the kinks in our own writing or to learn from? Uh, what was that experience like for you? Well, I did learn from it. Um, you know, I never had the benefit of being able to go back to that manuscript, that particular manuscript, because I wrote it while I was obsessed with Neuromancer. And I was in high school at that time. I went to Cast Tech in Detroit. Um, I ended up in, I guess, somewhat of an altercation on a bus ride one day while I was carrying that, the, the ink and paper version of that novel, which is in my, uh, um, in my three ring binder under my arm. And then sure enough, I'm getting off the bus and some guy punches me in the face. And that novel ends up in a slush puddle on the side of the road. And so I never really got to completely go back to the novel that was inspired, other than knowing it was terrible. Uh, I knew at the time it was terrible. I couldn't read half the handwriting. And all of the retrospect about that, you know, three ring binder was that it was not a good story. And then it was a total ripoff because I was only I was only channeling one thing, one set of concepts at the time. And that was cyberspace and, you know, futurism and this kind of dark cyberpunk thing that William Gibson was espousing and but interestingly enough like that the concept of simulation theory really really stuck with me over the years and so everything that I've written has always been from the standpoint of well wait a minute what if the author uh, uh, is a uh, role in the story and of course when we're writing fiction that's absolutely the author's role the author is the malevolent creator caretaker, and curator of everything that shows up in the novel. Um, yeah, but that really, really got me thinking. And so when I, when I went on the road in 2016, I, I took my camper out and traveled across the country. And I did have a lot of that time of isolation that you talked about, where you know, you're sitting in front of a screen, you're writing, you're rewriting, you're, you're interpolating, you're, you're looking inward, you're not surrounded by people, you're very isolated. And during that time, during that three or four year span, I wrote Failsafe, but I kept thinking back to the concepts that came up when I was working on that on that three ring project back when I was a kid. And much of it does resonate. That's why I like to tell people that I started the story when I was in high school and finished it two years ago. <laughs> um, it, that time traveling across the, the world, um, how do you feel like that the places that you visited uh, sank into the story? Because being... Being from Detroit, um, you you kind of get this certain idea of place and, um, okay, well, this story is going to be about a certain thing in a certain part of the country, but Failsafe doesn't read like that. Um, how did that time traveling uh, kind of affect the way you wrote or the way you saw the world, or uh, do, do you feel like that it soaks into the story at all? I think it does. Um, you know, I had this idea that, when I started working on like the basic plot points for the story, I was going to write a, a, a road story. In other words, it was going to be a real fast paced. Okay. They wake up this morning, they encounter this on the road, they deal with it. They wake up the next morning, they encounter this on the road, they deal with it. Then there's a mystery. Then there's this and there's that. And it all kind of would build as a very linear uh, story, which is what most road stories do. Uh, and that was definitely influenced by the experience of, of writing it, especially in the beginning, because I was spending all my time driving on this interstate highway system, which, by the way, I've actually got an outline for a nonfiction about the history of the interstate highway system, which is absolutely intriguing, um, if I ever get to that. Um, but so, yeah, there was a lot of influence in terms of the highway, you know, watching things pass by out the window, people that I would meet. Um, the, the, the simplistic nature of, of certain cultures and certain areas that I would visit versus the, the uptight, highly taught nature of other places that I would go, cities versus the country, different kinds of roads, the difference between a two lane road and, a, and an eight lane highway. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the nature, the personality, the color, the preferences, and the, the disposition of various people that I would meet along the way definitely influenced it. So I feel like if Failsafe reads like a, a road novel or a road story, it's probably not an accident. Although eventually I settled on one locale as the main setting for the story, which is a brothel. <laughs> Tell me about the village of Temperance. So the village of Temperance is a place that is very, very uh, simple. It's old fashioned. 
uh, I would liken it almost to a sort of tribal area where people grant trust to each other. And that trust is both implicit, explicit, and even tacit, like the actions of the people are dictated by a very, very high sense of trust in one another. It's a small community. It's primitive. There's a sheriff, but he doesn't have a gun. He, uh, he investigates crimes by befriending people. And uh, it's all very mellow. I, I want to call it, I guess it's kind of hippie-ish in a way, but it's kind of, uh, I think about the campgrounds that my parents used to take me to when I was a kid, the places we would go camping uh, around Michigan. And that's kind of what temperance is, mellow, campfires, small groups of people, uh, disputes settled very easily. And that's why the sheriff there doesn't necessarily need a pistol. So it's kind of a dystopian uh, Mayberry of sorts. Yeah, in a way, uh, there, there's definitely, it's <laughs> set up as the, initially you think that the protagonist is, is the sheriff, right? Tommy Dick and, uh, he likes it. He prefers it because there things make sense to him. And then all of a sudden he has to go investigate this crime where everything is completely different from what he's ever seen his entire life. And he realizes, OK, there's this whole other world where the rules are utterly different from temperance. And I, I kind of wanted to set temperance up as this sort of ideal at the beginning. When with we struggle from that point forward. When we when we first get into the book, tell me about the world that we're walking into. Um, you you told me a little bit about temperance and what the the ideas behind it uh, are, um, but but what's going on in, in the world in general? Well, uh, the people of temperance are what they believe about the world is that temperance is it. You know, they kind of deny that there's anything else, and if there is, they don't care, right? Uh, which I found is sort of a a sentiment that's echoed by a lot of what's going on now we see in pop culture. If, if people experience cognitive dissonance, they have a tendency to reject that there's any truth to uh, the, the facts or opinions that they're being presented with. And that's very much how the people in temperance are. But then there's this other society that exists out them and it's outside of them rather. And that's kind of the dominant society in this story. It's, uh, it's called the union public, which is this vast, I guess, nation of people who are participating in a completely different system than what this, this uh, tribe in, in temperance really knows. I mean, the one common thread that they both have, that both of these systems have, is that neither one of them really knows their real history. And uh, I kind of, I, I hope to kind of trickle out little tidbits about what they're going through as they begin to know each other. And of course, they're enemies when they meet. Um, the the antagonist, whose name is Alicia, is representing the, I guess, the bad guys or the big system. That's the oppressive system. And, uh, you know, the, the sheriff and the people that he meets along the way are representing the oppressed. So it's, uh, I guess, a little bit cliche in that respect. But uh, it's told through the lens of uh, economics. It's told through the lens of uh, racial dealings and racial assumptions. And it's told through the lens of uh, figuring out a lot of things that we that we haven't been able to figure out in the last few years, which is, you know, why do children go missing? Why do we place a great deal of faith in paper currency when everybody in the world knows that gold and silver are worth more and paper currency is innately worth nothing? And um, why are people inherently prone to warring against each other? Just uh, a lot of stuff like that. So some of these ideas that you're talking about that um, uh, were influences and, and things that you had fun exploring uh, as an author, um, did you go into this book thinking about those things or looking back, do you see that these things start emerging? You know, uh, was this intentional from the beginning or was this one of those things or, or these some of those things that emerged out of your subconscious and as the story unfolds you see these things seeping through um well i mean i'm thinking about the three main concepts in the book right as as you asked me that so i'm applying that question to each of the three um obviously child trafficking has been in the news for a long time uh, it's a real big deal it's getting bigger people are 
gaining awareness of it. So that was always on my mind. I didn't want to try to trivialize it and fictionalize it. So it, it remains very much in the background of the story. Um, but then there's two other concepts, right? There's the concept of uh, economics and what people place their trust in economically, what individuals choose to trust or mistrust when it comes to a medium of exchange. Um, and then weaponized disease, which, is, which has become a, a great conspiracy here in 2020. But I, I really stuck with the economic concept because, you know, my mom gave me a coin collection when I was uh, a few years younger. And as I started getting interested more and more in what she gave me with her coin collection, I started looking at the items that were in it, you know, gold coins, silver coins. And I, I was going back to the very beginning of the collection because I was interested in what was the oldest, what were the oldest items in the collection, like any antique you know, one of those uh, shows that you would see on a, a cut rate cable network. Um, right. You know, um, Hardcore Pawn or whatever those shows are. So I'm looking for the stuff that starts with 18 instead of 19. And sure enough, I'm going back there, silver coins. I mean, it wasn't a fortune, but there were several silver coins. There was a couple of small gold coins. And then as the years advanced, I'm reviewing the collection and I see that the gold coins and silver coins, coins become fewer and fewer. And it's more and more copper. You get into the World War II time frame, the copper goes away, and all of a sudden it's steel instead of copper. And as years progress, as we do this now with, with third parties and other experts, I'm realizing, well, hey, man, the, uh, the value of money began to evaporate. Eventually, we got to the point where everything was on paper. First, the paper served as a promise to pay in gold or silver. And then later on, that was replaced with just paper that was promised to pay in more paper backed by faith and credit. And when I heard the term credit, it took me a long time to figure it out, but credit essentially just means debt. And that paradox of people putting their full faith in debt is the essence of what Failsafe is all about. Yes, there's, there's horses and gunfights and saloons and brothels <laughs> and violence and all that, but really it's, it's a story about uh, economics and our understanding of it. One of the first characters that we meet is, uh, or, or that we learn about is Puck. Um, how does Puck and, and his story factor into the, the overall story? Well, Puck is a product of temperance, uh, but he's a little bit rebellious in his younger years. He's the, you know, there's this problem that's affecting the whole world called the dusty hump. This is where we kind of touch on that whole idea of weaponized disease. But this problem, the dusty hump, it's a disease that causes people to not be able to have children. And it often sickens or kills women who are pregnant. Um, and so not a lot of women are able to have children. And not a lot of men are able to, uh, to be virulent enough to, to impregnate a woman because of this disease. And so Puck is the only child that he himself has ever met. He grows up in temperance having never known a playmate his own age. Uh, the closest person to his age is something like seven or eight years older. And that person likewise has no playmates or buddies that are their own age. So when he strikes out into the world, into the greater world, not only does he not have the benefit of, going, of understanding what's going on outside of his village, he also doesn't have the benefit of ever having been in a schoolyard fight, uh, um, of having a scrap or an insult from a buddy, of uh, kind of going back and forth and busting the other guy's balls. Like he's never been through any of that because he essentially has no friends his own age. All he has is caretakers and older men and women who are fighting over him because he's the only one. So when he eventually gets to the main setting of the story, which is the brothel, he ends up getting into a big fight and triggering a huge, huge problem that uh, you know sets the rest of the story in motion. But it's it's mainly due to his ignorance. TJ, what I find interesting is that there are a lot of concepts in this book that, uh, when you published this last year, um, may have seemed, um, you know, like um, like the fanciful thoughts of a futurist. Um, yet when you read this through the lens of 2020, um, it's kind of creepy, you know, we're, we're talking about a worldwide disease or, or pandemic, it could be called, and, and the details are not the same. So, um, don't, 
for people that haven't read it yet, don't don't get it wrong. But the it, the it's concept, not the Bible, people. Right, right. <laughs> but the but the concept is is eerie. Um, and then we're we're talking about things like you so eloquently put about the role of money and and our view of money and how we uh, a lot of those things in real life are are coming uh, to the mass consciousness as we're uh, looking at at stores now telling us that they're having um, cash and 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 change shortages and mm-hmm. some very weird creepy things are going on. It's um, unprecedented. Yeah. It is. So looking back um, now, um, if if you would have known what 2020 would have brought, would that have changed the story that you told? And, and maybe that's an unfair question to ask, because who knows what you would have done. But do, do you find it interesting that so many things that uh, you kind of prognosticated in the book are kind of coming true? Well, I mean, it, I'm. I guess I have mixed feelings about it. I'm I'm excited by the fact that I I caught on to something that something was given to me that that turned out to be quite cautionary indeed, which is which was the whole point. I mean, I wrote Failsafe yeah. because I was concerned about uh, the world, and I'm you know I'm concerned about the conversations that I've had and heard with friends and family and and just people in general. Um, I wanted to to kind of raise a flag and say, wait a minute, what? What is money really? What is currency? What's the ultimate thing, or what's the ultimate force that keeps us placing our face in something that's printed on paper? Because Hank, if me and you printed that paper and it looked like money and felt like money, well, we would go to jail. But for some <laughs> reason, these other people have this this uh, this force or this power that allows them to take something that is innately worthless and cause millions and millions and millions of people to put faith in it. I'm certainly not advocating anybody go out and, and, you know, create fake currency or anything like that. But these are thoughts that I know exist. Uh, if people look a little bit deeper than the ink that's on the paper. And in the book, the, the, uh, the currency is called script. I wanted to use a word that rhymed with the S word. <laughs> so I came up with script. And uh, I think I've seen script here or there in one or two other places. Maybe it's some kind of British colloquialism or something like that. But um, so I was glad. I was glad that people started saying, hey, wait a minute. In your book, there's this there's this crazy disease that doesn't quite add up. Uh, there's people like saying that it's weaponized. It's very controversial. It's creating political polarization. Uh, it's bringing up issues and discussions around liberty and personal freedom. And so when I heard all that, uh, you know, I heard that from a few different people. And I've, I've read it in a review and I go, you know what? Good. Because those are things that I was concerned with when I wrote the book. The other piece, to kind of put the other side of the coin on that is, yeah, it's a little scary to think about. Because to answer your question, if I had known that this was how 2020 was going to go back in 2017, late 2016, when I was working on the story, I don't think I would have continued working on the story. <laughs> I think I would have... Uh, <laughs> I would have not gotten involved in the mortgage that I was involved in. I would have, I mean, a lot of things, I would have done a lot of things differently, probably. You, you've mentioned uh, a, a few times that the, the topic of the brothel, um, where the story ultimately kind of ends up. Um, what was it about uh, a brothel that, uh, that intrigued you? And, uh, you know, to the point where, you know what, a good portion of this book needs to be set uh, in this setting. Well, it started out as just a as an in, and I thought, well, gosh, that's not ironic enough. I mean, we need to be <laughs> able to say that the good guys are really, really loaded with warts and and, and blemishes and, and moralistic problems that they have resorted to doing things a certain way because it's all that's left for them. And this is presented prior to in the narrative this. The expose on the brothel happens prior to the presentation of info about this whole union public and this, this I guess, world government or whatever you want to call it, it which, of course, the people in the brothel deny exists, right? They don't, uh, they want to live in their little world and push out the realities of all the other forces around them. But uh, the reason it, it turned into a brothel and not just as an, as an inn is because I need a place where people could be plausible uh you know, unit actors, singer act, single actors, uh, actors for themselves, 
and bad actors ultimately. And I thought, you know what? An inn, yeah, you have somebody come off the road. They can. It would be a little bit cliche to say that a, a mass murderer showed up and caused trouble because he came in off the road. I mean, that seems too typical. So what I wanted to do is make sure that this was a very tight knit group of of faithful people to each other. And what better way to do that than to have a group of people doing something that's illegal <laughs> to help each other out? I love it. I love it. Um, TJ, so the the question uh, has to be, what are you working on now? You know, th- this book is this book is so much fun, uh, by the way. And it does. Um, there are a lot of heady topics and subjects that uh, that you deal with in the book. But in such a fun way, like it, it really keeps you turning pages because you get invested in these characters and you, you want to be part of what's going on. Um, but, you know, with, with someone that has such a passion for storytelling that you do, um, there's got to be something new that's uh, infected your brain. Well, there is. Uh, there's actually two projects going on right now. Uh, one of them is a book about the NFL that I actually started before Failsafe. Uh, it's a story about professional football. And the, I guess, the kind of uh, difference of values that exists between ownership, consumers, and the producers of the product, which are, you know, the main participants in the product, the players and the coaches. Um, so I'm working on, I've been working on for a while. I really had to, when, uh, when COVID started up, because everything about professional sports got completely turned upside down. And it's been interesting to watch the the actions of professional sports promoters in the wake of real professional sports. I mean, we've been without I mean, MLB has been back at it for what, a month or a month and a half. But and I guess the NHL is playing games, uh, NBA. But like the big one in America is the National Football League. Right. So and there's been nothing except off the field. I guess, politics that have come along with the NFL and just watching everything that's going on. I'm going back. I'm having the fail safe treatment on it. And I'm saying, oh, man, this is the crap I was complaining about in my outline three years ago. Now I have to go revise it because none of it's going to none of it's going to seem like it's on the cutting edge anymore. So that's one project. It's a story about the a novel about the National Football League. And then uh, you know, the other one, of course, is the, the follow up to fail safe, because uh, you know, the most important character in Failsafe is Bama, who is the gun wielding young lady that you see on the cover of the book. Um, and I love that visualization of her. Um, I had the artwork a long time before I finished the manuscript, three or four months before I finally got it into the editing process. And I would just refer to that picture uh, of her over and over as I as I worked on her character, because I feel like it really represents who she is. And I, and I caught a little bit of flack, by the way, uh, online for attempting to write a black female protagonist. Uh, a lot of people said that that's not, not something that a white guy should be doing. Um, but I referred them back to Arthur C. Clarke and a couple of others. And it is what it is. I, I get to write what I want to write, right? Because <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the writer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and you do it so well. This is such a fun book. Um, Fail Safe is available everywhere in Kindle edition and paperback. Um, audiobook too, right? Yep, audiobook. Uh, in a prior life, I actually have done a lot of audio production. Was on tour for a couple of years in a band. Uh, did a lot of music recording and production. So I actually narrated it myself. And I'm mostly happy with how that turned out. <laughs> <laughs> well, if uh, no matter how you like to consume books, it's available and uh, I promise you won't be disappointed with this book. Um, TJ, tell people where they can find you online uh, if they're just discovering you. Sure. Um, on Twitter, it's at TJ Wall Books. Uh, if you go on the web, it's www.agency-w.com slash TJ Wall. And uh, you can also email media at agency wcom um, The book's on Amazon. And like you said, it's on Audible, too. Excellent. We're going to put links to all that in the show notes where people can find you. Uh, TJ, this has been so much fun uh, catching up. Uh, Congratulations on the book, and we're going to send everyone to see you. Your program is awesome, Hank. Uh, I recommend it to everybody that I can. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, TJ. And to Dawn as well. Yep. 